In the Dies Irae, the, uh, the beautiful sequence that was sung during this Requiem Mass, we read, rather, the souls of the faithful pray, Remember, O loving Jesus, that faint and weary thou hast sought me. On the cross of suffering thou hast bought me. Let such efforts be not in vain. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Your Excellency, Reverend Fathers, Sisters, family and friends of Mrs. Helen Hurst, and parishioners. Today we are gathered together to commend the soul of this deceased woman to Almighty God. Many of you probably have never even, even met her. She did enter this church officially as, as a parishioner at the 11th hour of her life. After much consideration on the part of Mrs. Hurst, she did become, she chose to become a parishioner at St. Gertrude the Great. And this was within the last five months of her life. <clears throat> she was born in New York in 1936. She was raised a Protestant, and when she, she became a Catholic when she was yet a young adult. She married a Catholic, Mr. Robert Hurst, and she is survived today by four children, 11 grandchildren and 19 great-grandchildren, and I'm told there's another one currently on the way. For most of her life, she tarried within the, the modern church, that is the church of the Vatican II Council. She enjoyed traveling to Europe. She loved to explore the regions there and to see the beautiful sights, this beautiful architecture. Most of that, what is found in Europe, is in fact the remnants of our Catholic ancestors. Providentially, she would spend her last days in Ohio, close by this church. And she would enjoy the daily company and assistance of her eldest daughter, Helen. Now naturally, Helen, who, was, who is a parishioner here, she would talk to her mother a lot about this church and what's going on here. Her mother, Mrs. Hurst, she never took too much interest in it, in, our, in this church, until she heard some of the sermons that were being preached. Then she became interested. She saw something she had not seen before, or at least had not seen, had not heard, in a very long time. From then on, she was she was diligent in reading the bulletins, our weekly bulletins. She had a great interest in everything that took place here, in the ordinations of the Nigerian priests, in our sisters, our oblates, and in the school. She was at heart a, a Gertrudean. At length, she was taken to the hospital this past June and she was anointed by Father Simpson, given the last rites. At that point, she had already resumed the practice of wearing the brown scapular. And for those of you who are not familiar, that is, it's a piece of brown wool, which the faithful are enrolled in by a Catholic priest, and they wear it in honor of Our Lady. We have here, in fact, our Lady of Mount Carmel, the picture here, uh, that is depicting when she gave us the brown scapular. And she promises to those who wear it faithfully and persevere in prayers to Our Lady that they shall not be lost. It's a grand promise, but we have to wear it and pray. So Helen, she 
would wear it off and on because she complained. It's too itchy. And she had a lot of pain to suffer already. But Father, he insisted, no, it's in your best interest that you wear this scapular and you wear it always. And she listened. She would wear it and she was, find, she was found with it on her last day. Two months later, after she was anointed, I was, it was the first time I saw her. It was at the uh, hospice care of Beaver Creek. She always had a bright eye when I no came in to visit her. Her do door was always open to visitors, and she was a very pleasant and charming woman. It was always nice to go and see her. She suffered much, however, in her last five months there, and I'm told there were only three occasions where she was actually removed from her bed. And those occasions, it caused her excruciating pain. And she once complained to me of that, that pain of her bed. And she desired nothing more than to be released from her bed. She just wanted to be free again. And then I told her, well, it seems you cannot escape this bed. This bed is the cross. It's your cross. And just like our Lord, he, was, he embraced the cross and was fastened to it. You should embrace this cross from God. And you can atone for sin, your own sins and the sins of the world. And this, these, this comparison between her bed and the cross, it struck her. And she realized at once that, well, she is never going to leave this bed. But she also realized the gain to be had. She did her best to suffer patiently, and I don't recall she ever complained again. I've seen her, I've seen her several times myself, and she was also seen several times by Father Simpson. She received Holy Communion, often with great devotion, and she would pray her rosary as often as she could. She was weakened very much by her pains, but she would pray it, and especially when she was alone during the night. The Saturday before she died, uh, Father Simpson, he brought her Holy Communion for the last time. And it's quite touching. He says, he told me that it was not her want to do, she was not used, she would not shake his hand normally. Neither did she do so for me. But this last time, before he walked out the door, she reached out for his hand. She wanted to shake his hand. In gratitude for all of the graces, the sacraments she had received, thereby. And then she died during the night hours with the rosary in her hand. It's quite wonderful to see how someone, Mrs. Helen Hurst, who came from a Protestant background, she, she learned the mystery of the cross, the true mystery that we as Catholics believe. Namely that, well, death is a punishment for sin. St. John the Evangelist, he tells us that all of us have sin. And if anyone say he has no sin, well, he's a liar. But thanks be to Jesus Christ, who suffered. He took our sins upon himself. He died a cruel death in order to pay for those sins. And... By doing that, he has made suffering, death, the loss of, of loved ones even, all of these things which are a consequence of sin, he has made them all noble. There is nothing better in this world, this side of heaven, than to suffer and die for the love of God and in atonement for our sins. And this 
I believe Mrs. Hurst did quite well on her sickbed. Dear family members of Mrs. Hurst, you know parents are wont to give, to bequeath, their most valuable possessions at the, right before they die. They bequeath them to their children. Your mother found something in this church here more precious than all of the riches and beauty she explored in Europe. That is the true faith. She found devotion to Our Lady, the Rosary. Let these things be her legacy to you and take it upon yourself to study that faith she valued so highly at the end. And pray the rosary daily. Pray especially for the repose of her soul. Because again, we believe that we have all sinned and we all have to pay for our sins. If there be anything we have forgotten or have just not paid for, we have to pay for it at some point. And in the Catholics, we believe there is, there is a place called purgatory. So if we have some venial sins on our soul, we cannot yet be admitted to heaven. In fact, no one would want to be in heaven in that state because it is, it is a state of imperfection. Purgatory is where you would go to be perfected. Our prayers here can help her go to heaven more quickly. And the, for the children, her, her children and grandchildren, it is a duty to pray for her every day. Use the rosary, the prayer she died with. On behalf of all the clergy here and our parishioners, I do like, would like to give you our sincere condolences at the loss of your mother your grandmother, and we will pray ourselves that she may rest in peace. May God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. <clears throat>